Hi, this is Gavin Robertson at Niagara College Teaching Winery uh, in Niagara-on-the-Lake, Ontario, Canada, and you're listening to Cider Chat. Episode 140. Hello and welcome to Cider Chat. My name is Rhea Wincoller and I am the producer and cider MC of this weekly podcast where we speak with makers, cider enthusiasts, and folks within the cider trade from around the world. And this week we are up north in Ontario, specifically Niagara on the Lake. And we're going to be getting the lowdown from Gavin Robertson and his work at Niagara College, which is also known as the Canadian Food and Wine Institute. But it's so much more, because they're not only teaching wine, they're teaching cider making too. But I'll let Gavin and I get to that chat with you in just a moment. But in the meanwhile, here's a little news out and about in Ciderville. For all those listeners who get this podcast as soon as it goes live on Wednesday, then this is especially for you. Well, I should say, especially if you live in Northern California region of Sonoma, a big hotspot for cider has been kind of coming up for a while now. There is one cidery in particular. Well, there's a lot of cideries actually, uh, but one cidery in particular that I, I really adore because they have helped support Cider Chat, and that's Ethics Cider. So I'd like to share with you this new event that's coming up this year, happening tomorrow on Thursday, August 9th. So there's still time to get tickets if you're lucky. And it's called the Backyard Cider Salon. And what's going to happen is going to take place at the Handline Restaurant, which is based in Sebastopol, California. So just to give you a visual, uh, say you're Don't get there this year, but you want to go next year uh, because it will happen every year, of course. That's a little north of San Francisco. So you could like fly into Oakland. You could fly into San Jose, go to the the cider bar in San Jose called Cider Junction or head into the San Francisco airport and then just zoom up to Sonoma County. You will not regret it as far as cider is concerned. So anyways, getting back to this event, it's going to take place on uh, the 9th from 4 to 7, and it's a cider and food pairing. And you're going to have some cider from Ethics Ciders, who we adore here in Ciderville, Horse and Plow, Preston Farms, Ice Cider, and Golden State Cider. They're going to be all pouring their latest local cider releases, and Handline, the restaurant, will be pairing some of their delectable, they say, food bites with these ciders and best part is net proceeds of the event go to support the north bay just and resilient future fund so that's all farmer based uh good people at ethic cider i've met the owners of golden state cider haven't had all those folks on the podcast yet but you know i do adore california i I adore everywhere out there in ciderville i just want to let you know that's happening if you want to find out a little bit more about the sonoma cider week then you could go to the show notes. I'll give you a direct link where you could find out what's taking place today. It's going to go now through Saturday. Ciderville, can you feel the pace going on out there in the orchards right now? You, you're starting to see these posts coming out from Ciderville like it has begun. And somebody will have like a bushel of apples, some like early spring apples. Yes, it has begun. And uh, wow, if you listened to last week's episode, which was with Peckham's Cider from New Zealand, the top of the South Island in New Zealand. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you got to listen to that episode. That was 139 with Alex Peckham. He let us know what was happening in the Southern Hemisphere in terms of orchard care and cider making. It really was informative. I've been waiting to, to find out and and speak more present day. So in the Southern Hemisphere right now, they are pruning their apple trees and getting ready for that stage because soon it's going to be apple blossom season there, which is just, just it turns your heads around, right? 
But where we are, we are getting ready for the apple harvest. And some people are already harvesting apples in the Northern Hemisphere. And that means when we land in Normandy, France, coming up, oh my goodness, like next week. Is that true? Let me see. I'm looking at the calendar. Next week, it will be for me a month exactly before I arrive in Europe to be getting ready for the tour and to be welcoming people. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Ah, uh, boy. Um, I got to get going here. <laughs> Stuff to do. But I'm actually feeling pretty chill about it because I just got a little welcome gift for people. Uh, so I would say what that is, but I know that you're listening and I, I want you to be surprised when you land in Paris. Uh, it is cider related. Uh, yeah, that's all I'm going to say, but I'm just having a ton of fun with that, preparing uh, to welcome everybody, getting some extra hotel rooms for those who are arriving early. Uh, watch out, France. Here we come. There's going to be a side tour in town. Uh, yeah, that's crazy. Oh, my gosh, that's so crazy. Can't wait. So uh, I should say, because uh, I'm kind of like a little frenetic here right now, is that you should know that, yes, you could contact me if you want to go. And there's probably a good chance I might be able to squeeze a couple more people in uh, in the best way possible. It's like a loving squeeze. It's like a fluff another kind of squeeze. Uh, so no worries there. But but I am totally closing it August 14th. And this is a, a, a solid date. And then it's going to be only waiting lists. So if something happens, uh, that's it. And I will say I mentioned that last week and I've already heard from people. Soon we're going to be in France and talking about that harvest, biting into the palms in real time in France. That's going to, I just want to like think about that for a minute. I'm not that juice, about that juice experience and be able to actually taste the tannins, to smell the fruit, to see what it looks like, to feel it in your hand. Good, 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 good. It's got me going. So, <laughs> lots happening. I am in like supersonic pace right now. So, stay with me, Ciderville. When we come back, we're going to go to this chat with Gavin Robertson. And we're going to fill you in on what's happening at this college slash cider making scene and how it's just kind of taking off there and, and talking about Ontario. So, stay tuned. We'll be right back with all of that. This chat was recorded in June while I was on a cider tour with Ryan Monkman of Field Bird Cider. Uh, if you're a regular listener, you know that I've been rolling out these chats from Ontario, Canada. Uh, Ryan sponsored me to come on up and do this meetup with all the makers, and he really did an amazing thing for Canadian cider overall to give it the opportunity to get online like this with the podcast. And one of the first stops we did on the tour when I first met Ryan, he brought me to Niagara College to meet Gavin. And we went down in the back way. We kind of went down a dirt path. And, and uh, Ryan said, hey, you're in the trade, so we could take the back door. And we did, man. We went right into that back door where all the, the, the tanks were, the big stainless steel. There was like a, a barrel section in the back. And then sat down in the lab area at a big stainless steel table. And you hear a little fan action that we turned on and off, and uh, we just chit-chatted. Uh, it was really fascinating for me because there are, well, Canada is a huge country. Let's begin with that. I mean, it is huge. I mean, it goes coast to coast, just like the United States. Uh, not as many people, but this area is renowned for wine and if you go up to Prince Edward County, and I think it happens at this section too, in the winter they have to bury the great vines, which that's like burying a fig tree. Can you imagine like having a couple of hectares or acres of grape vines and then having to bury them and then unbury them every year? Wow. Well, it's also at the same time really known for apples. 
And the pace is starting to pick up in this region. And that's a bit what we're talking about with Gavin. I think his heart is really into wine is my sense, but the school is really going forward with cider. And he's part of that too. He has a virtual cidery. He's going to be telling you a bit about that and how they're meeting that demand for people who really want to learn cider making in Canada. So without further ado, let's all grab a glass and join this chat with both Ryan Monkman, who is sitting there at the table with Gavin Robertson of Niagara College at Niagara on the Lake in Ontario, Canada. We're sitting in kind of like the, the belly of this like little school here, right? This is the yeah. ground floor. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, I mean, what's the dimensions of well, this? Well, so, so we're on the Niagara and the Lake campus of Niagara College. Mm-hmm. And there's another campus up in Welland, Ontario. Uh, but this campus is devoted uh, in a big way to uh, food uh, and beverage sciences. Um, so we have a big culinary program chefing, um, pastry making, etc. Uh, we have a um, sort of a food science, um, food technology, research and innovation uh, department. We have a brewmaster program, soon to be artisanal distillation program. A enology, sort of winery and viticulture technician program, as well as a post-grad wine business management program. And actually in September we also have as part of our horticulture school, a uh, cannabis growing program, given that the legislation's uh, uh, changing towards allowing uh, right. not just medical, but, but recreational marijuana. What is that supposed country. to change in Canada? Uh, in terms of recreation? Very soon. Very soon. <laughs> Canada, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Beginning of July. Yeah. Beginning of July, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. that's a kind of a, a hot topic for uh, sales down in mm-hmm. the U.S. They're kind of documenting. Yeah, everyone's worried about it cutting into. Yeah. Beverage sales. Yeah, yeah. I guess we're getting some some data on that. Yeah, I guess out of uh, Washington and and Colorado. So, um, so the wine program has been around since uh, the year 2000, and was a direct response to um, growth in the Ontario wine industry. So specifically, the sort of fine wine grape industry. Um, As of the 70s and into the 80s. some producers, often uh, sort of European, Northern European, Germans and Austrians, had started um, planting Vitis vinifera, you know, the, the, the good European grape stock, and mm-hmm. started playing with ways to get them through the winter mm-hmm. and to come up with a style of wine that people were willing to drink. And in the 90s, 2000s, it really exploded, and you know, we have a, a couple hundred wineries in the province and about 18,000 acres under vine at this point. 18,000 acres, yeah, wow. Of, of, of wine grapes specifically. A small amount of that um, is still uh, table grapes, but the vast majority of it is, is for wine at this point. Um, so quite a healthy industry. So this program, or the programs we offer at the college support uh, that industry. Hmm. Um, is there, uh, you know, a lot of times a region has a particular wine that is like this, well, we would say in the brew business, like flagship or yeah. cider, the flagship. Is there a flagship yeah. kind of grape? The grapes or? that I think are, it's pretty agreed upon that do well would include Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, done in a fairly cool climate style, mm-hmm. so less less Napa, California, and more Burgundy, but maybe mm-hmm. somewhere in between because our summers are can, can be fairly warm. Mm-hmm. Um, some really good Riesling, um, uh, particularly from some of the, the limestone-based soils on the other side of St. Catharines. Um, sparkling wine is a, is a new category given you know, we, we can ripen it comfortably every day. Um, so there's more and more expertise, I think, in, uh, in making both traditional method bubbles and uh, to some extent uh, tank charmat uh, mm. fermented. Um, and uh, Cabernet Franc of the Bordeaux grapes, although there's a fair bit of Merlot and Cab Sauv in the ground, Cabernet Franc seems to be um, one that, that does quite well in our growing season. Uh, creates sort of a medium-bodied red that's kind of savory and spicy and, and really attractive um, and is pretty unique from kind of the French predecessor, pretty unique from anything else you taste. So those would be like, those would be the major, major styles. Now we're in St. Catharines, which is like a stone's throw from Niagara Falls. Yeah. 
is... This is sort of technically Niagara on the lake. So Niagara, This okay. is almost where the three meet. Oh, oh right. Yes. Yeah, right. We went over a bridge, I think, so yeah. Niagara yeah. on the lake. And the logic to this Niagara Peninsula is that um, we're to the south of Lake Ontario. So in winter, when Canada gets pretty cold weather, even in this most southern part, mm -hmm. uh, latitudinally, we're, we're, we're actually fairly you know, reasonably temperate at, at 43 degrees, but we still do get sort of continental influences. And Are you talking fair, Fahrenheit? Uh, or so lat latitude. Latitude. Yeah, oh, 42 yeah. degrees latitude. Yeah, 43 okay. or so. Okay. So, you know, that puts us on par with lots of growing areas in yeah, Spain, yeah. but we get um, the weather patterns in winter are towards big polar air movements that come across here, so we get cold. And that mm. would be the limiting factor in growing uh, Vita spinifera, for sure. Mm. Less so apples, of course. Um, right. Uh, and, and, and this area spans out along the lake here. It's not just around Niagara and the lake, but from what I'm guessing, it's going all the way up to like Prince Edward County. Well, and, and does the college sort of, cover that area? Sort of. <laughs> um, okay. So the major, the major plantings are all in the Niagara Peninsula, ending about Grimsby, and that's very specifically because Lake Ontario is to the north of us, so in winter when those sort of cold air movements come, come from the north, uh, they warm up over, over the open water. Mm -hmm. Prince Edward County uh, has really interesting soils, it is a much shorter growing season and is much colder, so they're doing different styles of wine there, mm -hmm. uh, and there's less bulk production, there's less commercial production hmm. because it's more challenging to, to When you say grapes. commercial, so is it more boutique up there? Uh, when it's in the, yeah, or, or just, home, just, home just home inevitably home. smaller. Smaller, yeah, okay. there, there's, there, there are very few commercial growers because it's hard to ripen, there are more variable vintages and it's uh, hard to grow to grow to mm -hmm. crop high. Okay. Um, whereas Niagara just has more diversity. You, you can grow more different types of grapes. You can ripen more more different types of grapes. You can make more different styles. Mm -hmm. What the county has going for it is really unique sort of heavy limestone based soils that's, that tend to show up in, mm -hmm. in their sort of distinctive mm -hmm. chardonnays and, and pinots in particular. And ice cream. And, and ice cream. Yeah, and ice, ice cream. cream. <laughs> ice cream. you got to get those famous notes, in there, <laughs> That's right. which I'm preparing myself for. Yeah. Um, so, is this the only school of its kind in Ontario? So, or there's there sort of three slash, I guess, four now options in terms of accredited institutions. Okay. So, that would be within the university or college systems. Awesome. Um, so, Brock University has an un undergraduate program. Mm -hmm. um, they offer a short, like, eight-month certificate or one-year certificate to specialize in enology and viticulture mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, for people who already have a, a science degree. Mm -hmm. And they also offer graduate work. Um, and there's a couple of research, a few researchers working at working Brock, so that's in St. Catharines. Um, and then Okanagan College just started a two-year um, uh, accredited mm -hmm. uh, diploma program, so mm -hmm. more like the college. Um, which would be more of a hands-on applied technical diploma. Yeah. Um, and I think Nova Scotia, the Nova Scotia Community College has some sort of offering. I don't think it's a full diploma at this point, but some sort of certificate. So when I asked you that question, I thought I was just talking about Ontario, but if you're jumping over to Nova Scotia, mm -hmm. are you talking about, like, that's it for all the schools in all of Canada? Mm -hmm. Wow, okay. Yeah, so really centered here in so, Ontario. So for the border. <laughs> Because yeah. I know there is like you know wine and um, mm -hmm. certainly cider happening out in the British Columbia yeah. region. Yeah, yeah. But this is it. So, folks coming to this school would be primarily Canadians, or are you primarily? Kind of although, um, yeah, we, we have several international. We're seeing lots of South Asian um, and mm. uh, and Asian students every year because those are expanding markets. So, uh, both in terms of production and mm -hmm. consumption. Um, our wine business management program in particular ha has a lot of international students because the wine business is, is global. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we see yeah, a, a few Americans here and there, mm -hmm. um, although there's no shortage of, of schools down there. So, uh, True, but, but, but this, we, is, this is a pretty neat spot here with everything from the Finger Lakes, we've had, um, I can think of at least two uh, sort of family wineries who've sent the, the mm -hmm. kids here for, for mm -hmm. education mm -hmm. because it's, it's closed. You're in sort of an interesting building on campus um, in that it is a, 
fully functioning, commercially licensed winery like any other in Ontario, producing about 5,000 cases of, of wine a year and, and a, some cider now in addition um, on 33 or so acres of grapes. And um, uh, the property also has a couple acres of hops in support of our, our brewing uh, mm -hmm. program and uh, a commercial brewery that's on campus as well. Um, and more recently, just a small little uh, high density side of orchard that we just put in this spring. Um, so we run as a fully functioning commercial model and also use the space as a classroom in support of the various yeah. uh, one, Experiential. One programs. Exactly. Right. So we involve the students in our commercial operations wherever possible. We'll assign them their own row of grapevines to prune and take through we, in September. Um, uh, in harvest, we're hand harvesting with them and conducting pressing comparison mm -hmm. experiments. Uh, they have their own pilot scale fermenters in the one part of the winery. Um, they have their own lab and, and workspace in the winery. So it's sort of this shared space. So mm -hmm. uh, we're making wine to sell to that the basically goes back into the program and into the facilities. Got it. Yeah. And how long is the typical program? There's probably a couple different levels. It's five terms, including five terms. a uh, work term, which is basically from September to December. So they go off and do a harvest, and then they, they come back to us for a final term. So like two and a half years then? Is uh, that about two years. Two, two years? years, okay. Yeah. And how long have you been working here? Uh, so I took the program in uh, 2009, graduated in 2011, and I did my co-op uh, placement here and um, I've worked sort of on and off you know, more or less full time ever since uh, with a few breaks to travel and uh, make wine elsewhere. How did you get into this Gavin? What was your interest? Were you like a wine drinker at yeah, an early wine, age or wine, your family? wine drinker um, and I traveled in Europe and picked a few grapes and was sort of generally familiar and, and liked it. Um, but I was uh, living in, in Toronto and took a bike ride out along Lakeshore uh, just for the week, I just had a few days off, and um, I was like, you know, generally familiar with the notion of Ontario wine, but didn't really realize until I got out here and started biking around Niagara the Lake, um, just how significant an industry it was, mm -hmm. and saw the vineyards, and talked to a few people in the area, and was was pretty interested with, uh, you know, with uh, it as a career possibility. Um, now what I back. liked about it, I guess, I was looking to to get into a career that was maybe a little more hands-on than, than what I had been doing. Um, and what I liked, what I think kept me was the seasonality of it, that the, the jobs were the shifts with the seasons, that middle of winter you're doing one thing, and middle of summer it's completely different in a lot of ways. And what kept me here is that it's this really dynamic, sort of interesting environment, and that I'm making wine like it would be at any other small winery, but it's also you know, full of students and research projects, and uh, mm -hmm. we, we have a sort of interesting, unique role to play in, in the industry, I think. Especially right now with what's going on with cider. You mentioned that there's this growing interest, and you have a block of cider apples. I mean, how, mm. how big of a... Like Small, I think it's 0.3 or 0.4 of an acre. So okay. we just we had some drained, irrigated land beside the hop yard, and we thought um, we... You know, we, we've been getting a lot of requests from students just about how to make cider because it wasn't built into the, the, the wine curriculum. But you can make cider under the same license as grape wine. And so all of many of the existing grape wine facilities in Ontario are in the cider game now. And it makes a lot of sense uh, commercially because in that really busy summer cider season, your tanks are often pretty empty because you've mm -hmm. bottled up for, for spring. And so from a product flow sort of commercial perspective, it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And so we realized pretty quickly at the school that it was an important aspect of what, what we should be teaching, just, just as we kind of got into making sparkling wine to demonstrate to the students the technicalities of it because the Ontario wine industry was making more sparkling wine, mm -hmm. we decided we had to be making mm -hmm. cider um, and other sort of cider-based fruit, fruit beverages, I guess. We have um, bees on campus as well. We have a eight-month um, apiculture sort of certificate, beekeeping certificate. Wow. And so I've been making a little bit of mead with, uh, with our campus honey and doing some cider, cider blends with that as well. Uh, we try to use fruit and botanicals from our uh, horticulture programs, from our, our gardens and greenhouses in some of these sort of single lot mm -hmm. ciders that, that we make. Mm -hmm. so, um, so it's a neat sort of collaborative 
thing. Wow, what a think tank scene yeah. you have here. I mean, yeah, it's fun. It's like the, kind of like the job that everybody would just love to be in because it's so diverse. Sure. You get all these different, probably people coming in, the professors and folks yeah, teaching are from yeah. all different yeah, venues. Yeah, I mean, you know, people have come from the restaurant industry in different places, lots of different influence, but everybody sort of has this appreciation, I think, for, mm. for you know, not just the products, but for the craft, which mm-hmm. is what's, what's really great about sort of existing on this campus. When I think about Canada, one of the first thing always comes to mind in terms of cider is ice cider because I, I look at Quebec mm-hmm. as Quebec, yeah. the birthplace of yeah. ice cider in the world in that way uh, mm-hmm. as a real specific technique. Yeah, yeah. And we're in Ontario and you haven't really mentioned ice cider, but is, is that... I, I haven't made one, although probably I will yeah. this, this winter. You know, at this point, so, so Quebec just in general, I think, you know, is quite progressive and also traditional in the, in their cider making, um, having inherited a certain kind of northern French sort of thing, just 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 inevitably. Um, Ontario has just been less serious about cider in general for you know, um, or, or it's just more more new to the game, I think. Um, but uh, there are Ontario ciders, no question. But there's such a market for either kind of new world pub style ciders anyways mm-hmm. um, that f- probably fly out the door a lot faster sure. and out of tap handles at pubs a lot faster sure. um, if you're one of the kind of medium to larger size producers mm-hmm. and even kind of the big commercial giants like Artero, you know, Vincor, X Vincor, X Constellation type people with the growers and stuff. Mm. You know, the Molsons of the world certainly have cider mm. products on tap as well. But right. even if you're kind of medium sized, you can you can flip, you know, apple juice pretty quickly. Mm. Ice cider would be more special to Yeah, absolutely. You know, in yeah. the same way that ice wine, dessert wines in general, sugar as much as people still eat lots of sugar. <laughs> they don't like to admit it. <laughs> so I just don't know that there'd be, you know, the same market for not for, yet, yeah. Not yet. Yeah. And my understanding was Molsons that really kind of put a uh, really cramp, or uh, you know, on production of cider in this country, yeah. and that there were, you know, kind of like written into the laws that was really blocking cider's growth. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, that's quite. I, I don't know the history of the legislation. Certainly, all those big producers have their cider mm-hmm. brands now because mm-hmm. um, offshore brands like Summers B, you know, these kind of El Copapi mm-hmm. commercial cider our apple-based mm-hmm. things, can't really call them ciders, um, are, are so popular. Um, so there's a lot of controversy right now in sort of truth and labeling and the craft cider associations in the various provinces mm-hmm. looking to make it more clear to the consumer when we're, when we're dealing with locally grown apples and true apple-based products versus mm-hmm. water and sugar and citric acid and some a- apple flavor. <laughs> It, in the U.S., we have the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Trade, the TTB, which oversees it. What oversees the that? The Alcohol and Green Commission of Ontario would give you your license. Um, and beyond that, it's really CFIA regulations. So in the grape industry, C-C-F- the Canadian Food Inspection oh, Agency, okay. Thank you. at this point, um, the, so, so as in sort of European wine regions, Ontario, British Columbia, uh, both have um, uh, the Vintners Quality Alliance, which is a kind of quasi-governmental regulatory agency uh, for producing 100% Ontario, British Columbia uh, content wines. Um, And so if you see the VQA logo or the words VQA Ontario, VQA Niagara Mm -hmm. Lake, some regional designation, you're guaranteed that everything that in that bottle um, was grown in in that uh, that province or that smaller appellation, that smaller designation, and also that the wine conformed to some basic standards of quality and truth and label. Mm. And so the wines pass through a tasting panel, um, a chemical analysis mm. panel, um, and uh, and a label review. And so, so that's really important in terms of consumer protection and and uh, and maintaining and sort of enhancing quality. Mm-hmm. At this point, the Ontario Craft Cider Association is looking to get into something like that, but it's a process. This started in, in Grape Wine in the 80s and 90s, 
um, uh, and don't quote me on this, but we can look it up after, but EQ I think was 90 or 91. So it's been around for long enough and it's a constantly sort of evolving set of regulations um, that are made in collaboration with the industry. So say a new like skin contact white wine category is coming into vogue, then we'll get a bunch of heads together from the industry, both front of house, back of house production, uh, wine writers and be like, hey, what you know, what it, what what is the style? How do you define this? And and how do you communicate to the consumer that what they're drinking is going to be like something? And how do you make sure that that it kind of tastes good? So it's not a guarantee that it's like an excellent quality, but it's a minimum standard, and it bro- it broadcasts sort of to the consumer that it is what it is, mm-hmm. which is really important in any sort of mm-hmm. fine wine mm-hmm. region, I think. Now. This is the wine region of Ontario. How broadly is it exported? And and what, um, you know, I mean, here I am kind of living right over the border. Mm-hmm. I'm not too far away from sure. Canada and relatively, you know, in the U.S. And I didn't know anything about this. I mean, I, you know, I think it's kind of myopic type of view, but... I feel like shouting from the mountaintops is like holy smokes! Like people don't realize. So there's lots of it creeps up. There's in lots spots, of but. practical and sort of trade barrier reasons for that. It's just expensive to export. Mm-hmm. Um, it's state by state. It can be tricky to get your wine out. And as soon as you start moving it like that, people start taking a piece mm-hmm. off your profitability. The kind of good news, bad news thing out here right now is if anything. Our biggest problem is there aren't enough grapes. Sales are very good. Domestic sales are good. Exports are as good Mm. as they've ever been. Um, Exports tend to be a pretty specific business model for producers here because the majority are fairly small. Like Mm. even our medium-sized wineries are tiny relative to like, you know, your average California winery or Australian winery. Mm. There's um, five or so large, large players who all have export programs. Um, there's some medium-sized players who would have their specific export models, and in particular for the, the ice wines, for the dessert wines, mm-hmm. and in particular to um, Asia, because there are big markets for, for, for those wines. Mm-hmm. Um, so not to say that there's smaller producers don't export, they, they absolutely do. You can find mm-hmm. some of our boutique like premium wines on, you know, uh, Manhattan wine lists and London wine lists. Mm-hmm. It's just there isn't that much being made, right? Mm-hmm. right? Just in terms of acreage, we're like a tiny Appalachian in in a fairly small Appalachian in the Loire Valley, right? We're just we're not big at mm-hmm. this point, and similar to British Columbia, there just aren't that many grapes, uh, and the domestic market's healthy, so there isn't a lot left really to 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 bother pushing hard to sell and paying for a sales mm-hmm. agent and all that stuff. Right. Yeah. So is there, you know, like when there's not enough apples, more trees are being planted. Mm-hmm. So is that the same thing with the grapes here? Yeah, yeah. And apples, it's a big problem right now too. Not nearly enough apples. There used to be okay. think, closer to 40,000 acres in the province. I think there's only fourteen or 15,000 right now. Because... Uh, because the market bottomed out for baking and eating apples and the was fresh that all market. culinary? You're yeah, talking yeah, about. yeah, all yeah, the fresh all market cool. stuff. Red delicious type of. Uh, yeah, apples. yeah, all okay. eating apples. Yeah. And so for the cider industry, one of our biggest issues is yes, lack of apples. Often the industry now is running out sometime in June, uh, in most years, and um, you know people are having to shop over, across provincial borders and occasionally down in Michigan and whatnot. Mm. Um, uh, and again, these larger producers who are getting into cider production will mm. only kind of uh, uh, make that worse. But yeah, there are more orchards being planted. Mm. Um, cider, spe- so so not just a shortage of apples. The other biggest issue is almost none of those are I, even heritage, let alone cider apples. That most of us are relegated to making cider from dessert apples, dessert from eating apples. apples. Um, is that what you're working with with your cidery? Often for our, our main pub, and then we, where we can, we're supplementing with crabs. We're trying to source smaller lots from smaller growers mm-hmm. for single lot bottlings. Mm-hmm. Um, but of course, all the craft people are trying to do the same thing. So, if you're going to be proactive um, as a as a 
cider operation, then you really need to be a grower and you need to be controlling your supply. And that, that's becoming pretty apparent pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, the successful, serious cider people are going to have to plant their own mm -hmm. orchards. Mm -hmm. Right now, I don't think there's enough incentive for the professional apple growers to just move into cider apples because they there's no guarantee on premium pricing. Um, there are different pathogens and things that they would have to look into carefully. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of stock, right? Mm -hmm. And certified, especially certified virus free stock. So it's it, it'll be a longer term process um, mm -hmm. where where particularly on the growing side, production isn't gonna keep up with demand. So for now we're relegated to using what we have and chopping over the border occasionally. I think if necessary, although usually that's those would just be the bigger guys late in the season. Mm -hmm. um, if you sign contracts early, you can, you can get the apples yeah. you yeah. need. Um, but it's a very young and very you know it's this very new thing, so everybody's just trying to figure it out. It, it feels young in Ontario the cider scene, but at the same time, it feels it. Much like the U.S. was getting pro with prohibition, mm -hmm. the same thing happened in Canada, yeah, exactly. right? So a lot of uh, People are making cider, and then it's kind of like getting this yeah. start, like this train going up a hill again. Is are there feral apple trees in the area? You know, like people going and kind of scrumping and knocking on mm -hmm. doors and saying, yeah. "What do you have back there?" Like little small backyard things. Yeah, you were down here, so Niagara Peninsula isn't so much apple country, although there used to be more because the land's too valuable mm -hmm. uh, for grapes. Because you can't grow grapes where it's colder. Um, it's pretty much all grapes, even a lot of the peaches mm. and plums and cherries, the traditional tree fruits mm -hmm. that did better here because it was warmer. They've been pulled out for grapes because that, so that's the crop mm -hmm. um, down here. But as soon as you go up over the Niagara Escarpment and it starts getting colder, so even not too far from here to Font Hill, suddenly there's, there's apple orchards again and there are some older um, uh, uh, orchards in there then some of these farmers are realizing that there is once again a market, and a lot of those apples probably went on the ground for, for a long time, yeah. and there is a market. So how, how far is that from here? 20 minutes. 20 minutes, 15, okay. 20 minutes. And so, so the elevation so, is so just the back of the line, you see that hill? As soon as you go up over that hill, it drops three, four, five degrees centigrade in winter. Which direction are we talking? East, west? Back of the vineyard. Back of the vineyard yeah, would yeah. be south. South, south. south. okay. Yeah, because yeah. 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 so, it's pretty flat here. And yes. it feels a little bit like Kansas, and yep. I expected that coming here. Where do you drive in from? Uh, Just along the uh, right over Niagara, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. not over the falls directly, but yeah. you know. So you came down one hill, that's the Niagara Escarpment, and it runs okay. from the New York side all the way up to Georgian Bay, about 800 kilometers. Um, and it's this limestone ridge, uh, and where we are below the limestone ridge and between Lake Ontario, that's kind of the warm growing area for grapes particularly. As soon as you get up over top, you lose a lot of that moderating influence mm. from the water. Mm -hmm. um, so it gets back into apples and field crops mm -hmm. and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But the, the most apples are actually up towards uh, Georgian Bay, uh, Bruce County. The, that's where a lot of the ciders are and just a lot of the, the bigger growers are. Isn't the Georgian Triangle? Yeah. 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 Which is kind of a very yeah. cool name. And certainly if you drive those roads, there's lots of A lot of them. Lot of, okay. So, you know, it's, huh. it's a, it would be about small operations figuring out how to crew up, figure out who owns the land, get picking mm -hmm. wins. Like, mm -hmm. there, and I know, I know of at least a couple small operations who have made it their mandate to sort of forage, as you see mm -hmm. in yeah. Hudson Valley and, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and whatnot. But... Um, I think it's a bit of a nascent thing mm -hmm. at this point. Do you have, um, on, I'm going to call it like a homebrew club or a wine clubs, or is there a, a lot of folks doing that around here who aren't necessarily going for the commercial level? Um, maybe, you know, probably not any of the beer students coming for sure. here. And then beer? Okay. I would say, and then the home wine thing, like it is a thing I think everywhere, although yeah. if you live in this area, it's, there's a lot of pretty serious wine professionals, lots of sommeliers, yeah. lots of people who work at the winery, so it would be a, a relatively higher level, I think, okay. of just like sort of wine connoisseur in this very specific area. Um, but um, cider, 
not, you know, maybe less less of a thing. <laughs> But okay. I don't know. I mean, yeah. certainly. So far. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Certainly, yeah. we get like in the last three, four years, I get inquiries all the time, being like, "Hey, where can I get apple juice?" Well, that's <laughs> you know, which is music which is in brand my ears. New. That's exactly. pretty cool. Yeah. So clearly, um, and I know personally a couple people who started off brewing beer because that's, that was the traditional homebrew thing. Thinking about cider, doing some cider, who have actually gone into commercial operation in the Hamilton area, and the, you know the neat thing about cider. Um, is uh, you're seeing kind of more urban cideries, uh, or at least people like dancing on that notion. Mm -hmm. um, there's still a licensing requirement that if you want to sell retail product, then you have to. It has to be on a on a farm. There's a you have to have oh. planted acreage to get that retail license. But you could still have an urban cidery and run it as a brew pub, uh, you know, sort of like beer, or ship straight to licensees. So there are there are options with so I'm trying to understand that. So you could have an urban cidery, but you would get. But, but you can't. You could never sell like a six pack of okay. cans. You, you could can't only sell be on to cust customers. You could sell to restaurants, bars, or you could pull, or you could have a restaurant license, bar license, and pull pints. I see. But you can't actually sell directly to customers, and right. that's just the way. This that is pretty limiting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Prohibition. So who works stuff. on that legislation for? For you know, upstart cider makers who are like, I don't know, that, that's not fair. So that's the Ontario Craft Cider Association would be one, the major lobby mm -hmm. group, representing a certain subset mm -hmm. of 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 cideries. Um, uh, yeah, beyond that, I don't know. <laughs> and it's a government of. Uh, I mean, yeah, this it's is a, a it's provincial. Yeah, it's, it's provincial. Right. I mean, Ottawa is the capital, right, of Canada. Yeah, and Toronto, but the provincial government is based in Toronto. Toronto. Are they getting that there is a, a growing Still market? Moving. In that so, way? so some positive signs have included ability for an end with winery license to sell product at farmers markets. That was some, previous to that, you could only sell at your single retail store to licensees uh, or to the LCBR through the provincial mm -hmm. distributor. Mm -hmm. um, and they added on grocery stores more recently, a certain number of licensed grocery stores, so that didn't exist mm -hmm. in the province mm -hmm. until, what, two years ago, a year yeah. and a half ago. Ah. And um, the ability to basically take a retail license and use it as an off-site thing for farmers markets. So baby steps in some ways relative to more open distribution regulatory systems, but mm -hmm. They're listening to some extent. There's been some useful, I think, economic impact studies, particularly on the, uh, on the wine industry. Um, if you look up the uh, uh, Canadian Vintners Association, you can find, find links um, just showing the sort of total economic impact. So mm -hmm. from a you know, relatively small farm gate um, value of fruit, say three or four million bucks, that balloons pretty quickly when you consider all the tourism it generates and all the B and B's and restaurants and the forty thousand jobs mm -hmm. in the province, etc. So, um, so uh, you know, I, I think the province can't ignore that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. No, I haven't. Since I've come over the border, surprisingly, I haven't tried to buy any alcohol yet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> We're going to the LCBO. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I, you know what? I recall. I mean, last time I was cruising through Canada. It was kind of like really regulated, a little bit like our mm -hmm. listeners would know, like New Hampshire, you have to go to like a state package yeah. store. Is that still Same. true? Yeah. Still true. So, and that's true for wine, spirits, yeah. beer, I mean, and cider. Yeah. Again, with a little loosening in terms of now you can go into one of every 10 grocery stores and mm -hmm. they'll have a section. But generally speaking, it's still true. And you could, can you get singles, or do you have to, like, Pennsylvania, yeah, you can only get a, a case. Yes, yes. You can't even get singles. Yeah. Can you go into a bar and take singles? No. no. So it's only at these, like, state-sanctioned, government, yeah, government provincially run, provincial. uh, right. distribution right. stores. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. Liquor Control Board of Ontario. Right. Yeah. Does anybody... It's province by province. So um, Alberta, for instance, has public-private. So they do have provincial liquor stores, and they also have private licenses in uh, Nova Scotia as well, to a lesser extent. That's interesting. But, so a little bit of the Wild West there, they've yeah, taken yeah, it yeah, on, and yeah. to the east, a little yeah. bit more wild. Quebec, you can go into corner stores and buy, I think, I don't know if you can buy spirits, but you can buy beer and wine. Huh. Yeah. So, you know, if you live on the border in Ontario, you can't, so you drive across mm -hmm. and you can buy beer at a corner store. It kind of feels like Although it, you're not allowed to bring it back. 
Right. <laughs> there's some exactly. pretty, in the courts right now, you can follow the journalism, there's some pretty out of date provincial trade barrier yeah. rules as well. And so the Supreme Court just ruled <coughs> so, so, so it's depending on which province to province, wow. you can't even like purchase and cross the border <laughs> internally with it. So wow, yeah, yeah. that's a real it's deterrent a long, to business, you know. I mean, unraveling it is, and especially yeah. as these industries have grown, and it's like it's a highly competitive wine, cider, beer, whatever world <laughs> because you can import anything you want. Yeah, um, you know, there's a these behemoths like California <laughs> sort of. Chopping at the bit to get the product on LCBO shelves. Mm -hmm. so, garage door ciders. So, um, this is a, a virtual. So, it's just one partner and I, very modest, very little sort of capital. And it was as much to let both of us play a little bit outside of our, our main jobs are in wine, wine production and education, of course. And, um, and uh, his in wine and beer sales. But we're both just really interested with what's been happening in, in the in the cider. No, no. When you say virtual, that's something that I think folks in the wine industry would, would know a little bit more because mm -hmm. that's been going on for a while. But in cider, that's something that you don't hear too much. So, mm -hmm. what is a virtual model? Like, yeah. What are you talking about? There? So we don't have our own bricks and mortar production facility. We're operating under another license. Um, uh, in someone else's facility and just uh, basically producing small batch mm -hmm. ciders regularly, sort of seasonally, mm -hmm. um, direct to licensee. We're not even packaging at this point. Um, and that's partly to do with the tax structure and partly to do with labor and manpower. And um, So is that cakes then that you Cakes straight to, to, to licensees, mostly in the GTA, the Greater Toronto area. Because um, we're in a large population belt here. So you're shipping it out of Niagara on the Lake region, all the way up to Toronto. Toronto, and... as far as London, Kitchener, Waterloo, Guelph, Toronto would be our largest markets. We have some local clientele, but just relative to, to those places. Mm -hmm. And in a, in a big way, um, in Ontario, I think your average cider drinker, um, they, they may be sort of wine people, and there's certainly lots of crossover in, in kind of the urban foodie set. Um, but often I think they're a little more like craft beer drinkers, which is to say they're interested in new, novel. So we're targeting, um, we're not trying to compete for regular taps at sports clubs because we can never contend with the big companies and the deals they cut and uh, the merchandising and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. we're, working with uh, a pretty select like group of what we would consider like higher end craft oriented mm -hmm. bars and bars and restaurants mm -hmm. who are interested in sort of whatever new thing we come out with and it gets rotated through and then we make something else. So we although we do make kind of a base cider for, for a few people who, who, who keep it on tap regularly. Mostly we're doing real seasonal things and one offs and we rarely repeat. Um, uh, using wherever possible um, Ontario ingredients. That's sort of our, our main mandate. Uh, but it's a little, you know, versus I guess our, our day jobs, which deal with, with, particularly with wine, which does tend to be more vineyard oriented, and I, and I love that about it. it it's about place, mm -hmm. um, it's about vintage. The way we found our way through cider was, was a, a little bit more playful, more like craft beer, a little more sort of ingredients driven and conceptual and it's been just sort of a fun outlet alongside I think mm -hmm. our, our day to day jobs yeah. interesting so would I assume correctly then that you're doing a modern style cider yeah often and we I mean we do bone dry and we do certainly more traditional like indigenous uh, older oak barrel fermented um, ciders but the market frankly isn't so much there People are interested in in uh, Toronto and those yeah, pockets. Yeah, okay. again, we've and this this is not today, but wait till tomorrow. This is purely Kevin. anecdotal. <laughs> this is purely anecdotal, but um, we got into it sort of assuming that we were going to make more orchard-driven, uh, bone-dry, serious ciders. The immediate hiccup is access to that fruit, right? If you don't have. Mm. <laughs> you know, acres of Kingston Blacks to pull from, which you simply don't in Ontario. You can, you can try, but the 
apple cider made from Max doesn't <laughs> taste the same. You can make it as dry as you want. It still mm. isn't good. Mm. And so um, mm. we've been working on blends, varietal blends. We've been working on with aging, these aging, these contact mm -hmm. to, uh, to plump up the mouth. Mm -hmm. um, using both indigenous yeast and um, playing with different strains from um, some, some friends who um, have their own yeast company out of Guelph, so they're culturing their, their own yeast stuff that they um, isolate, like in a Quebec orchard, for instance. Um, what was that company's name? Escarpment Labs. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, the, one of the partners, one of the four, I think, they're all microbiologists, guys from the uh, University of Guelph, all grads. Uh, one of them is in our beer, brew master, uh, or brew science department. Um, so, um, yeah, so we're, we're, we're playing with technique. We're, we're trying to get in season the best possible apples we can. We're, we're trying to, you know, for the more traditional ciders, um, to get at least the better of the eating apples, things like russets and spies that have higher natural sugars, mm -hmm. acids, mm -hmm. occasionally phenolics, tannins, mm -hmm. when, uh, when possible, although there are very few apples in the ground that are true bitters mm -hmm. of any, any mm. sort of cloth. <laughs> um, so, so that was the first thing that, that we found. And then on top of that, the mark, most of the market, they really don't want to pay for seven, they, it's hard to sell 750 mil format, even, even naturally bottle condition. Um, it's hard to sell dry. Um, we're going in very dry in general, but um, you know the English scrumpy thing. It's just it doesn't exist for a lot of reasons, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It may at some mm -hmm. point, but it's all of it's that agricultural side that has mm -hmm. to come along. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know we're doing small like fifteen to twenty keg batch sizes often, mm -hmm. and we sell it out within a couple weeks. Uh, we're always overlapping batches, and when it's gone, it's gone. So Sounds it's like a good business it. model yeah, for what you yeah, have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's sustainable. Do you like, have first dibs on those cider apples out there? <laughs> of course, but for, <laughs> for the college, not for my own okay, company. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm making actually probably much more cider for the college than I am even for a garage door. Um, it's quite, quite a healthy category. So we sell growlers and cans, so we do package for the college okay. in house here. Uh, I'm well, doing, I'm what doing, is that called, that, that brand that the college Just the Niagara College Teaching Cider. Okay. Um, Cider 101 is kind of a, the general skew. Um, is, but uh, but I, I am doing bottle condition stuff for the college. Um, so my actual larger cider role is still at the teaching library, teaching cider. Garage door is just a small sort of weekend aside, side project. Sounds like a good one. If you want to try some of the ciders that we were talking about in this here episode, such as the Niagara College ciders made by the students, and I did try some, uh, the, you know, Cider 101 is uh, really good, rock solid, and they have some specialty ci ciders there, a lovely tasting room. There'll be some links in the show notes. Also links to find Gavin's Garage Door Ciders. There's two Toronto bars. One is The Verse in Toronto and Bar Vola. They serve that on tap. Fun stuff happening there. Uh, now that they're going to have that cannabis program, who knows, maybe Canada will take the lead of doing kind of an, a, like a, a cannabis cider. Certainly we have the hop ciders just waiting to see that first cannabis cider that is uh, worth your dime and mine. So lots of good stuff happening up in Canada. Stay tuned for more episodes and uh, thank you so much for spending time with us, Gavin, and best wishes to Niagara College. What an amazing operation, lovely people, fantastic tasting room. And you just stole my heart when I heard that you could barely keep the cider on the shelves because everybody's walking in asking for it. Best of luck to you all. Thank you. 
Starter Chat has a Patreon page, and if you haven't heard about Patreon, it is a website that helps content providers like me keep on doing the work we're doing, such as rolling out this weekly podcast. So it's really easy to find. You could Google it. You could go to ciderchat.com and find out how you could support this podcast. And there's different levels of, of support that you could do. You could join the Patreon page. I haven't had anyone join for a while. You can make a one-time donation. You could become a, a larger sponsor of this podcast, such as Fieldbird Cider did up in Ontario to definitely help bring this episode to you this week and all the episodes coming out of Ontario. Uh, that is a big way to help. So if you find it in your your heart to do that and feel that this this uh, podcast is worth your while, and I suspect you do if you listen this far, then do become a supporter of Cider Chat today. Just go to ciderchat.com and you'll see all the different ways that you could help this here podcast. This is Rhea Windcaller signing off for now. Looking forward to seeing you in Ciderville. Going up, going up. Yeehaw!